Everyone, this is Tom Salemi. Welcome back to Device Talks Tuesdays. It's great to have you here. We have a great, great discussion. Uh, a lot of star players here today. I'm just going to be standing off to off to the side, playing cowbell or whatever a second raids do when uh, when these stars will present their information and, and give the, the latest on uh, on the topic, which is keeping up with critical changes in robotics image guided technologies. We'll talk a lot about visualization and imaging and robotics and how the two sort of intermingle. Now let's get into our conversation. Thanks again to Biomerics for uh, helping us put this panel together. Our panelists today are Jeff Penman. He's president of Biomerics Image Guided Intervention. We have Adam Sachs returning to Device Talks Tuesdays. He's CEO of Icaria Surgical and Todd Houston, CEO of Active Surgical. He's also a returning guest. I'm excited about this conversation because I feel like we're really at, a, at an intersection of all these uh, really game-changing technologies coming together. I want to get into sort of where we are in this uh, in this place. Uh, I do invite the audience again to, to bring in your own questions. I'll try to incorporate them into our conversation when possible. We'll also save a block of time at the end. Don't wait until the end to ask your questions. Uh, I'm sure you have some excellent ones after those those presentations. And uh, let's get a, a, a good conversation going amongst us all. So just to, to sort of start off, uh, just to, to kind of a, to present, uh, give us a sense of where we are. Uh, Adam, you can kind of lead it off, I think, and then bring in in, uh, in Jeff and, and, and Todd. But how, how, how have robotic surgical systems advanced over the past five years? I mean, it just seems over the, for me at least, I'm just seeing so many companies emerging with so many different approaches, uh, so many different technologies. I think yours is, is one of the, the, the more differentiated ones. But uh, what is what has transpired over the last five years or, or began five years ago that really made that allowed for all these these new approaches and these new companies to, to come together and to or to not to come together, but to, to, to bring new ideas to uh, to the uh, to the market? Yeah, so I think that there's a, a few different things that have happened uh, all at the same time here. Uh, one that is, um, is uh, I think, particularly interesting and relevant that's been very relevant for some of the larger players in making, um, uh, huh, I'm seeing that folks cannot hear the audio. Is that? Yeah, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, Matt, we'll, uh, we'll troubleshoot that so let's let's All proceed right. as if it sounds good i'll fixed just, if, I'll just if keep going um, yeah. sounds good keep going as if people are hearing me um <laughs> uh so so uh so there may just be one or two people uh, so. Go ahead. sounds good there's uh there's uh a few different really interesting things here right first is is patent expiration you know, it's not a coincidence that patents last 20 years and uh, about 20 years after uh, uh, the Da Vinci system was on market. Uh, it's uh, there is uh, an opportunity for others to come in. And that looks like a number of the larger players who are approaching uh, this from a very similar perspective and a very similar approach to to the intuitive that's that's been on the market for the last 20 years. Uh, there's also a number of other companies that are like us that are taking a very different approach to to the problem. And I think the biggest thing for us that enables what we're doing is uh, is it's actually not the patent expiration more than anything else. It is cell phone technology and consumer electronics technology. You know, at the end of the day, I think it wouldn't have been possible 20 years ago to achieve what, what we've been able to achieve and to do what we're able to do because it requires uh, a number of technologies like cell phone cameras, uh, rigid flexible PCBs, really small uh, chip scale package sensors, and a ton of other sensors as well that have really enabled uh, us to put everything inside the abdomen through one small incision instead of doing things from multiple incisions uh, from, from the outside in. Interesting. And, and and well, Jeff, from your perspective, I know you're you've been on the imaging side more, but with with biomerics, uh, I'm curious as to are you familiar with the companies you work more in the surgical robotics side, and any sort of takeaway or feelings as to to how we're getting to to where we are in robotics? You know, so my focus is largely on the imaging side, but there, yep. but I, you know, peripherally, I see throughout the biomerics family, one of the things that's really enabled a lot of things, and and I think what's exciting about some of the videos we saw was the articulation inside of the body 
And one of the things that's really uh, enabled that is some advances have been made in the in the metals processing. So some of these very small micro machining, uh, making cables, you know, coiling cables, those things have really enabled a lot more articulation and action in the body, which allows things like what we've seen, where you have one single port, you can look back on back where you came from. I think that's a really uh, big advancement in the last couple of years. Interesting. It's a really it, good time, and I, yeah. I I totally agree. <clears throat> is that? I don't know. We'll expand on that. I mean, is that something that that Vicarious has been able to to uh, build upon? That's that's allowed you to get to develop what you've what you've got. Uh, yeah. So no no question at all. Um, it's uh, it's a three D printing is actually uh, one of the bigger pieces that we've been able to leverage here. Uh, metal three D printing in particular uh, that. You know, in, in a lot of ways comes out of some types come out of MIM, uh, some out of out of uh, uh, plastic 3D printing processes and some are, are, are unique as well. And um, all of these, what they allow us to do is drive much, much lower cost of components, uh, you know, uh, almost MIM like cost in in uh, in volumes that are, are nowhere near uh, metal injection molding uh, volumes. But even more than that. It allows us to iterate quickly and do features that are not possible uh, without 3D printing. So I'd say, you know, we we leverage a ton of different uh, manufacturing technologies at everything from metal injection molding, plastic injection molding, metal 3D printing, plastic 3D printing, uh, and and machining as well. Fantastic. And Todd, let's talk a bit about uh, visualization. Same sort of question uh, you found in 2017. Active Surgical was. Uh, what has allowed a company like Active Surgical to, Surgical to come together? I know we had your your company on the on the uh, Device Talks Tuesday. I think last year we had one of your founders talk about its origins. But what really has allowed the company to 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 develop the system that you have and mm -hmm. to, to to develop the traction that you're getting both uh, with hospitals but also with investors? Sure, I I, I think. Um... Tom, the key thing, and I came here in 2019, and we had just completed the uh, world's first fully minimally invasive autonomous robotic procedure. And again, is the world ready for full autonomy and robotics? Um, I'm not sure. But <laughs> the, the opportunity for a robot to go from you know being an assistant and augment the surgeon to actually complementing the surgeon by being able to identify and make decisions and perform certain functions of surgery, I think is where Active comes in. We were at the... Um, the SRS this year with Dr. Vip Patel, the, the Society of Robotic Surgery. And there's amazing robotic technology out there, and Adam's company being one of them, just this superstar leaders and superstar technology. Um, and and the, where it's going in the future is advanced visualization and AI and, or machine learning. And what we're bringing is with edge computing and on-site sensors and devices, we actually believe that the reason we're able to survive is we're bringing that last mile edge equipment uh, into the operating room, meaning so the fact that we can sit in the operating room um, with our science and identify things by just attaching ourselves to a scope, um, identifying structures by the press of a button, blood flow, key critical structures, veins versus artery, et cetera, et cetera. And then through the data that's collected and the, and, and the, the annotation that's done and then the machine learning algorithm have a place for that data to come back in a full circle in the last mile, as I said, and go back to anyone that uses that little device and all of a sudden identify new insights that are going to be available for our physicians. That's why I was comparing it to Waze before. We're going to tell you there's an accident up ahead or a key landmine or landmark that you can see. And what makes it really nice in that sense is um, we become agnostic. You know, I want every robotic company to be great and be successful. We want every scope company to be great and be successful because we can work with them all, whether it's laparoscopic or robotic procedures, because we want to just help enable them all to see things that aren't visible today. So then we can use the superpowers they each have in them that they're already built with to, co to continue to help the surgeons. And Jeff, you were at, at G for, for a time uh, in imaging and x-ray. I'm curious, what, what was your takeaway from uh, seeing what Active's uh, making available to, to, to surgeons and, and how far has the field gone from, from your perspective? So, you know, I, I was at G for 12 years and I've been away for a little while, but one, one of the things uh, we talked about a lot, which I, I it's now starting to come to fruition, is augmented reality. When I look at the stuff that uh, the Todd's doing, you know, seeing seeing things that really aren't there but are being highlighted, th those make a big a big difference. Uh, and 
I think the other exciting thing that about you know visualization, just with actual video, uh, is that it's not uh, ionizing. So one of the things that's always been a, the rub against X-ray is that you're you're injuring people when you're X-raying them, and it's not as much an issue for the patient as it is for the doctor. Like I have a, a neighbor of mine whose father recently was a urologist, recently died of cancer, and the cancer started in his wrist. Like nobody has wrist cancer. Wrist cancer only caps to people like urologists who are sticking their hand in an x-ray beam. So I think all these, these advancements in imaging, especially video and ultrasound, uh, really reduce the risk to the patients and to the clinicians uh, uh, substantially. And a lot of that, as, uh, to, you know, to Adam's point, a lot of that's being enabled by just the miniaturization of the semiconductor industry that's driven by cell phones and games and all that sort of stuff where we can get two cameras where we used to have one and now we can look at a stereoscopic image and uh, get a, a better uh, a better idea of what we're looking at. We can change the color of the light that we're illuminating the area with and get more information about blood or cancer or things like that. I think just the smaller the electronics get, the more efficient the LEDs become, things get more and more exciting inside the body. What I like about this conversation I, is I hadn't really, I'm sorry, Adam, go ahead. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I think it's, uh, uh, that, that's also spot on, right? It's uh, what, what, you know, what Jeff and Todd are saying. Um, it's uh, from our perspective, you know, it, it, everything is about, you know, miniaturizing the electronics, being able to fit as much as you can into a procedure, into an operating room so that you have as much visibility as possible because all of this, you know, creating, creating ways requires technology like Todd's camera or, or, or our camera, right? It's, uh, it requires, you know, the more of these things that we can fit into more surgical procedures, the better information that we'll actually have. And it's one of the struggles I, you know, I, I agree the world's not, not ready for fully autonomous surgical procedures. And I, I think we hear, we hear a lot of conversation and buzz about automating things and, and the idea of building a self-driving car but, you know, not only do we not have identification of tissues today, but we don't even have, you know, the LIDAR, the radar, the, the, the basic sensing that exists in, uh, in you know, self-driving cars today in surgery. And we, we have all the capability to put it in. Um, I think a little plug for us, I think that particularly with, you know, the way our system goes in and expands and creates uh you know, a, a lot of extra physical space inside the abdomen, all of that is done so that we can incorporate a ton of, of uh, different sensing technologies um, uh, and, and collaborate with folks like Active uh, mm -hmm. in order to fit that inside, inside of the abdominal cavity in order to get all of the data we need to know what the surgeon is doing to know what they're, what tissues they're approaching, what tissues they're manipulating, so that we can help them make better decisions. And Adam, I, I in, in agree. And then Tom, you had asked part of the question before in, in the investor community, and then Adam talking about autonomous cars. And you guys know that I, I do a lot of the analogies towards that because <laughs> it's something I understand and just it, it makes it simpler, even to the investment community that's not all medically based. I mean and I've said it over and over, why does a 17 year old child who's getting their driver's license have a rear view camera? Um, they have this information that we didn't have when we were 17, but it's the same information that you and I have when we're driving. They have a side view mirror with an orange light on it that they, so, so they don't have to turn around and look when there's to, to switch lanes. That's just information, their seat vibrates. That's just when they switch lanes by mistake when they're texting and hopefully they're not. That's just information, but I have the same information when I'm driving, but a surgeon doesn't, the, the information of a, of a fellow to a surgeon that's been practicing for 20 years, that's all experience and intuition. There's not extra information that th there's no cheat sheets for that fellow other than experience. And we want to be the cheat sheet. There's no reason why, you know, the future of autonomous cars is effectively putting into practice machine learning and computer vision and sensors to take data from around the world. Right. And, and using it to make safer decisions. Well, the same can be said for surgery, you know, how we can take these novel technologies and allow surgery to be safer by showing blood flow or key critical structures or tissue characterization information. So every surgeon has the same information and every patient, no matter where they are in the world, has the confidence that their surgeon has the same information to complete the procedure, no matter what their experience level is. I agree. And I, I think on this on the same front, uh, I, I 
I don't think people are ready for a fully automated robot, but what we'd like to do, you know, and we like to integrate the sensing and the imaging and then the, and the intervention. So what ideally what you could do is you could have a surgeon that maybe is removing a tumor and as he approaches uh, different areas of tissue, the device helps him decide whether that needs to be ablated or not, or may even take care of that, right? So, so just guiding the, uh, the physician as he's doing this action to, to take the action is needed is kind of where we want to focus. That's really interesting. I mean, having to talk, I've talked to Todd, I've talked to you separately about active surgical, I've talked to Adam about vicarious surgical. I actually never put visualization and robotics together in, in terms of how they, they, they could be used uh, in the same procedure. I guess my, my question is, does improved visualization guidance system, does it increase or decrease the need for surgical robotics? I mean, if surgeons have that better field of vision, mm -hmm. uh, that increases their performance and makes them better surgeons. But uh, does it make the the opportunity for a, it? So it would at least appear to maybe not require a surgical robotic system because they're able to do them themselves. But on the flip side, if you have that kind of data coming in, it seems like a perfect opportunity for a surgical robotic so, system to plug in. So, so Tom, let me, let me let me jump first, if you don't mind, Adam, because I sure, know yeah. that you know I know I'm pretty positive Adam's going to say it's going to it's going to of course it's going to need robotics, and I actually agree. And, um, you know, remember, remember some of those, like I said, superpowers of a robot, you know, the, the, however many degrees of freedom and the fact that the physician can visualize whether it's multiple screens, you know, multiple visions right on their screen, on their, their monitor, and, and the, the use of, of really intricate devices and technology, you know, just by small little controls. That's a huge advantage. Now imagine if you can see things that you've never seen before at the same time. So now the surgeon, uh, she can take the robot and move it to where she's seeing something that she's never seen. And then imagine when the robot, I mean, one of our, our key advisors, who's a, the, the, the number one robotic surgeon in the world, um, he shared with me, when a robot can see something that a human can't, that's when it's really going to continue to take advantage of these superpowers of robots. So I absolutely think the example I was using on a prostatectomy, Doctors need to remove the prostate if a patient has prostate cancer, but they always tell their patients the number one risk side effect is cutting that nerve or the landmark artery. And because you can't always see it, there's a procedure called nerve sparing prostatectomy. The only problem is you can't see the nerve. What if you can see the nerve before you start cutting and then the superpowers of the robots that Adam and companies have uh, take over. And that's why the, the two together, uh, I think are the most powerful engine in the operating room. Couldn't agree more. It's, uh, you know, it, it, again, it's I, like, I, I think it can't possibly be overused, the self-driving car analogy, right? It is it is building the system so that it doesn't just warn the surgeon. It, it can actually step in and, and help them, you know, help them prevent an injury, right? If I'm tired and I'm driving my car, you know, I my car, it's uh, pretty difficult for me to rear end somebody because it will stop me before I do. And it, it, it's, you know, not only does that not exist in surgery today, but the base, the base sensing to enable it doesn't exist in surgery today. And all of that requires hardware, not just software, to be added in, in order to sense what's going on inside of the abdomen during the procedure. So to take a couple of, of specific examples that we're building out, right, our, our camera, the, the way we built it out has, has way more physical space It goes in and turn goes in sideways and then turns. Uh, it has, has some active thermal management systems as well. So uh, all of this allows us to pack a, a ton in there uh, that, that actually you know, can literally include LIDAR, dot projection, uh, 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 a number of additional technologies that allow us to start to not just map the abdomen in 3D, but to you know, identify different structures, like to take a couple, you know, like Todd was mentioning, right? Vessels, nerves, uh, ureters inside of the abdomen. And then you couple that with robotics to, to your question, and you can actually allow the system to avoid injuring patients. And uh, you, you can even couple that with, with, for example, our system senses every force at every joint. And we, we actually have electronics in the arms to do that. And what that allows you to do is it allows, you know, you add that with tissue identification and you can have a system that literally says, okay, you know, this is, you, you know, we have a fenestrated bipolar tool and we're manipulating bowel 
this is the maximum force that we should be exerting. And the, t the, the system can do that automatically and can avoid inadvertently injuring the tissue. And the, the beautiful part of all of this is that what it actually lets you do is become more efficient in the operating room. Because a huge chunk of what good surgeons do with their time is dissect down planes and carefully identify tissue. That's, that's, that's the crux of what a, a lot of good surgeons spend their time doing, is dissecting down to the nerves, correctly identifying the nerves, and then, then picking them out. Uh, same with, with you know, blood vessels, the common duct in a, in a lap coli, the ureters in a hysterectomy. I, I mean, it's just procedure after procedure. And having a system that can allow you to do this without actually, you know, it can allow you to avoid those injuries without doing every piece of the detailed dissection, saves a huge amount of time and, and can increase revenue for the, the surgeon, increase revenue for the hospital, and, and help more patients. Yeah, I, I actually think it's the opposite. I don't think that better navigation and imaging makes robotics less. I think it makes robotics better. Because if you think about things like uh, electromagnetic navigation that gives you position and orientation data, that has to be translated into an image that you put up on a monitor that the image that the surgeon can look at and then and figure out what to do, where a computer just takes those numbers and makes an adjustment. I think what can happen with better imaging and better navigation you can make the robotic surgery faster. And I really, when we talk about minimally invasive procedures, we talk about smaller incisions, less damage, but also less time under anesthesia. So I think, you know, better navigation and better images is gonna make robotics better and better uh, as time goes on. Great, we've got a couple of questions from the audience. I'll get into those in a, in a moment. Todd, I'm just curious, uh, what sort of response are you getting from uh, from hospitals and from from surgeons that when the, when they're seeing this, I mean, if you look at the before and afters, it's it's pretty stark. Yeah, you know, it's very unique, uh, Tom. The the technology of ICG, we, we didn't come out to start competing against the dye. We actually can see ICG with our system. So, um, it's been around for seventy years, and uh, it's very unique when you go to a thoracic surgeon, you talk about an esophagectomy, or you talk to a colorectal surgeon and doing a left uh, left colectomy procedure and talk about an asthmatic leak. It's, there's no, no question there's an unmet need there. So it's not one of those that you have to say, hey, do you ever have one of these? First of all, you shouldn't ask that, but at the end of the day, everybody has them. You know, the data in an esophagectomy, it could be 22 to 24%. And in a colorectal procedure, you're talking about anywhere from 2%, it could be 18%, but they have a mortality rate of 15% once, they're, once, they, once they occur. And they lead to major readmissions. So from a hospital standpoint, right now with CMS focusing so, so heavily on readmission rates, anything that can reduce readmissions from a cost structure is a big deal. But from a physician, um, the number one cause of an anastomotic leak, and that's just cutting something out and sewing it back together. When you sew it back together, there's your anastomosis. Number one cause of a leak is inadequate blood flow. If you already had injected dye, as I showed in that demo an hour before, the dye may still be in the system. So if you're injecting new dye, you don't know if that's if it's a false positive. It, you oh. know, I've used this example once before and why the hospitals seem to really appreciate it and doctors do as well. Using ICG for post uh, anastomosis, if you've used it for pre, is like turning on your ways, if we're gonna stick with this car, turning on your ways, driving somewhere and, you're, and the data right on your screen says, there was an accident here two hours ago. Now. I don't know what that means. What do you do with that? Does that mean there's still going to be traffic? It's cleared up versus let me see what's happening now. So because it's real-time information um, and we're reducing readmission, the hospital feedback's been outstanding. And then from a physician, all we're doing is what's the downside of pressing a button because it works seamlessly with the system you already use. We're not asking right. you to buy this whole big capital equipment. Stick it on your, 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 your scope system that you're using press a button, and before you exit the patient, just make sure there's adequate blood flow or you're identifying key critical structure. Again, trying to keep it simple. Wow. Uh, we're going to get into questions in a moment, but but Adam, I know you've had a couple of, uh, you're, you're getting some, um, forming some relationships with hospital groups real quickly. What, what sort of responses are you getting from providers? Yeah, I mean, it's been, uh, it's been absolutely phenomenal. Uh, we, you know, 
uh, we, we're incredibly proud to have uh, a number of really deep hospital relationships that I think are fairly unusual at our stage. You know, not just investment, but but also uh, uh, these deep, you know, center of excellence relationships uh, uh, with uh, university hospitals and HCA healthcare, and uh, 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 a new relationship as well that that we uh, just announced yesterday. Uh, with uh, uh, Pittsburgh Creates and UPMC. Uh, the, the feedback overall ha has been really, really positive. And, you know, I, I'd say that m most of all, I've been really inspired by, you know, each of these hospital systems, not just the surgeons, but, but the hospital administrators. They're pretty relentless focus and interest on patient outcomes at the end of the day. And, you know, maybe some of that is because, is because it's uh, uh, helped drive drive patients, drive surgeons to their hospital systems, helps uh, avoid financial losses in a number of ways. Uh, I, I, I personally think from my interactions, it, it's mostly because it's why people get into this business is patient outcomes at the end of the day. But they've been really uh, impressed overall with a number of elements of our system, particularly our ability to do you know, things like a complex abdominal wall repair, like a retrorectus hernia repair, in times that make it practical with technique that makes it practical to fit more cases into a shift and to make the entire ecosystem around it much more efficient than what they have today. Right. Those are some great systems that you're uh, you're affiliated with there. So, all right, well, let's, let's take a moment and... Uh, Take a look at some of the questions. If folks have uh, questions they'd like to add, uh, please do uh, please submit. And uh, I've got plenty here as well, so we've got lots to talk about. Uh, so one question from uh, one question from uh, uh, someone from the Robotics Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, could you talk a little bit about uh, this? I guess would be for you, Adam. If in what roles notes uh, natural orifice transluminal endoscopic surgery will play in the future of surgery, especially as it was mentioned that the current robots face the problem of motion and incision sites incision site planning. Yeah, so uh, it's a really good question. I'll tell you candidly, I'm not I'm not a big believer in notes. I, I know that's a bit of a controversial opinion, but. Um, <laughs> I personally think uh, single incision surgery is incredibly important because if you put the whole robot in through one single incision, then you move past the abdominal wall and you're actually able to operate from the inside out, right? With our, our system, you know, what, what we're designing it for is that the surgeon can operate anywhere in the abdomen from any incision site facing in any direction. There's no incision site planning to be done anymore. Whereas notes, I think, particularly can confound that and can, can actually add a lot of complexity, whereas you, you don't just have a single site that you have to go through, but you also have uh, kind of a single approach angle uh, for the entire procedure. So it can be incredibly limiting. And I think the real question with notes is, what's the advantage, right? With today's single port <laughs> surgery, I think there's a pretty big advantage. You know, Today's single incision systems are, are two and a half centimeters uh, at, at, Realistically, there are at least three, if not four centimeter incisions. You need to cut through the muscle. You end up with uh, complication rates that are uh, in the ballpark of about 10% just from the incision site. But with a system that's you know down to 18, 15 millimeters, you can bluntly dissect, use an obturator, and actually uh, 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 avoid those, those complications at the incision site. Then you can place that incision wherever you wanted with a system to easily close it as well, you, you really lose a lot of the value of notes. So notes is incredibly cool. It would be kind of my punchline here. But <laughs> at the end of the day, operational efficiency and workflow are king. And it, it's every solution I've seen to date has been a, a, a huge negative on uh, impact on, on both of those. All right. Well, that's going to make some headlines. Anti-notes. <laughs> anti not anti-notes, just a counter to notes. I'm not anti-notes. Anti <laughs> I'm not anti-notes. I'm skeptical. I know you're not. I'm, I'm skeptical of the ability of notes to be practical for a large percentage of patients. Very, very good distinction. I, I didn't mean to put words into your mouth, Adam. I apologize. <laughs> uh, okay. question, All good. Que question following up on the uh, 3D discussion uh, uh, reference earlier. 
Uh, someone who just asked, what percentage of 3D metal or plastic printing components are now part of the day-to-day -day surgical procedures? Uh, Jeff, any, any any thought on that? Yeah, I think right now it's very, very low. Most things are, you know, machined out of a, a billet. Uh, yeah. But I think one, as time goes by, there's a lot of advantage of a 3D printed or uh, MIM sort of part to get you in the ballpark and then just to machine it the rest of the way. And the really, I think the driver for that's going to be um, single use instruments. So sing single use instruments need to be very cost effective. And if we can s reduce the machine time and, and get them those prices down, I think that's really 3D will drive that. So I, I see that to be a growing technology. I think right now it's very low, but I can see it increasing uh, quite a bit in the future, both 3D and MIM. Interesting. So looking forward a bit, and we'll get back to audience questions in a moment. I just, it, in hearing the three of you talk about the, the, the connection between visualization and, and surgical robotics, uh, do we see these companies, Todd, do you see yourselves, you, you mentioned that you would be happy to work with any surgical robotics companies, but do you see some sort of a closer affiliation coming with surgical robotic companies uh, that maybe you know, really want to get under the hood of your system and understand how it works and be able to, I mentioned they could just plug in. I don't, I don't know how that stuff actually works. It's probably a lot more complicated than that. Do you see yourself having more closer connections to surgical robotics companies and and vice versa, Adam, uh, how are you looking at visualization and do you see yourself working with more Thanks. with external companies or do you keep it in-house? So Todd, well, you first. Um, you know, I, the, the simple answer could be, it could already be happening, Tom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but, but the, so, so, so the answer, the answer is, is absolutely. Remember, we're not trying to, you know, one of the unique things about active is we're not coming out to do a laparoscopic procedure or a robotic procedure. We're not trying to compete with robots. We're not trying to compete with scopes. And we're trying to take what they give you and the benefits and enhance it and allow you to do something else so they can keep focusing on what they're great at, right? And um, so the absolute, uh, our goal, our model is almost, we can do it ourselves and bring it in ourselves, but we can, we can work with any system that's there. And obviously over time, as you continue, you know, to be technology uh, agnostic, you know, we just have to make ourselves hardware agnostic, whether that's working code development, whether that's working different manufacturing, whether that's just attaching ourselves to existing systems. Um, but the technology is absolutely agnostic that, that works and, and in our opinion makes all of these systems um, perform at a, at a higher level. So they again can do the things that make them special. And um, so, so we, our business model is based on us walking into a hospital or walking over to Vicarious or other hot robotic companies and working with them as well. And there's multiple opportunities for all of that. So partnering is absolutely part of the play. Um, but like I said, the nice thing about the way that we went through the FDA is I, while I would love Adam and all the scope companies to say we want to use Active, I don't have to have Adam or all the scope companies say we want to use Active because we've already been FDA cleared to walk into the hospital if a physician wants to use they can in conjunction with these other systems, but partnership and all being friends in Kumbaya is a lot nicer. <laughs> <laughs> and Adam, how are you looking at uh, the visualization and its future uh, with your system? Yeah, I'd say uh, candidly, you know, we've developed a good uh, uh, handful of uh, the, the technologies in it ourselves. We've leveraged a bunch that are frankly off the shelf at this point that we didn't develop, but you know, partners uh, uh, like Todd and and uh, others, you know, outside of uh, medical devices as well, have developed, and we can work with them. And you know, often, you know, they are partnerships. They'll help modify what they're doing to work for our specific system. But at the end of the day, we're we're really buying you know pieces of our image stack from each of these partners and then integrating it into our technology. And I'd say that's actually been a key of, you know, how we're going to be able to bring a surgical robot to market for a few hundred million dollars instead of a few billion dollars. And the, the, the big difference is that we are at the point where a lot of these base technologies exist, where we can work with partners who have developed them out and can just modify them to work in, in our system. So uh, it was a very long way of saying uh, yes 
partnership. <laughs> but the, but it was every word was necessary. Jeff, how about you? How are you seeing this uh, this marriage? Right, I'm muted. So we're seeing a lot of the same same sort of stuff. So traditionally, you know, either the the instruments and the scope were separate, maybe went in through different holes in the body. Later, as people started trying to combine that, they maybe ran a, some sort of an imaging insert down the working channel. But we're seeing lots and lots of trends to have the imaging and the robotics all one thing. Uh, because what happens is, once a doctor sees something maybe in the working channel, and then he's got to pull that out and put his, uh, his instrument in there to do his intervention, now he's blind and he's lost something. So really, we feel like, uh, almost every device should be able to see what it's doing all the time. So I, I think you're going to see, I mean, our motto is, on anything is, would this be better with a camera on it? And mm -hmm. we look everywhere we look, we say, would this thing be better with a camera on it? And uh, so I, I see robotics and imaging just being, uh, you know, joined at the hip pretty much from here on out. And Jeff, in, in working with companies that are developing these systems and dealing with surgeons, I wonder, do surgeons, and Todd, like you're taking this too, do they do they know that everything's better with a camera on it? Do they, or do you sort of have to show them? It's kind of like Steve Jobs, you know, you you don't know what the customer doesn't know what they want. I have to show them what they want. We see both. We, you know, because some things there are complaints. You know, where we get ideas on where to go next is just observing. You know, maybe they don't articulate that they, they don't like that, but if you watch them and you can see in their body language, the frustration, the labor, you can see that. And sometimes they actually do express it. But in other cases, I think we have to show it to them and you have to have that aha moment, you know, and then, then there's no going back. Well, if you think about it for years, um, visualization or imaging is everything. So do you think that most surgeons want to send a patient out of their care to go get an MRI or to go get a, C a CT scan or to inject a dye and have to wait for it to go through the system? I mean, if they can see something in the system that they're using while they're using it, um, you know, that's, that's pretty advantageous. It's hard to argue with that versus, you know, I've been to robotic cases in the past where they taped up CAT scans or MRIs. They just taped it right to their, you know, to their imaging so they can still wow. see the pre-pictures. And now they're, you know, they're all, in, and it's going to continue to integrate. So that's all going to become live and have overlays. And I get all that. But the, I'm just one of those scoreboard person kind of people. The scoreboard says doctors want to see as much as they can. That's why they're willing to go through all of those steps to finally get the picture that they want. So if I can give it to them in real time, or Adam can give it to them in real time, or Jeff can, I, I, I don't think the... It's, more, it's a voice of customer right now to find out if, if imaging is an advantage. I just think the facts are stating that it is. They're, they're craving for it. Very cool. A couple more questions from the audience. Uh, someone's asking for an opinion on, or, or, or perception of where ultrasonic design standards will be in, in 12 to 24 months. Jeff, do you have any thoughts on that? So we have a lot of experience with ultrasonic uh, uh, therapies and we're, we're finding that there's more and more avenues for that from histotripsy that's uh, doing uh, ablation to, to tumors to crossing uh, chronic uh, total occlusions. Um, drug delivery uh, is there. I think there are, we're going to see more, you know, the question was standards. I definitely think we're going to see more and more ultrasound help deliver stuff and more maybe. Oh, we lose audio. Yeah. I don't know. All right. It does do cavitation. Okay. We lost we lost about the last fifteen seconds of, of what you said there, Jeff. Um not sure why. Yeah. Can you you're hear me you're now? here now. And yeah. yeah. I don't know if you if you yeah. had the if, if you want to reset anyway, the last I'm just part. Saying that I think there there definitely will be some standards to kind of make sure that we're on between being effective and uh and you know, causing injury with the cavitation. Excellent. All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, just someone had asked uh, about what's the current scenario with tactile sensing and robotics? Has it developed to a level of satisfaction? I think you hit upon, were you hitting upon this a little bit earlier, Adam, or uh, where are we with tactile sensing and robotics? Yeah, I, I would say, um, you know, tactile, uh, I, I think, uh, uh, can mean a couple of different things. Uh, uh, for, for us, 
we are sensing at each joint uh, the force inside of the abdomen. And for yeah. providing you know, true haptics back to the surgeon, that, that really is the limiting factor, right? It's not the surgeon interface portion. Actually, today's surgical robots that are on the market have that. Uh, it's the knowledge of what the instrument is exerting onto the tissue that's missing. I, I, I will say, you know, surgeons absolutely want that, but, you know, they, they want the sensing. And I appreciate the, the way you're asking that question because they, they, uh, they, I think they want the sensing. They want the knowledge of the forces that they're exerting without actually needing to feel every force and exert every force themselves back into the system because that's, you know, back to being, frankly, physically tiring and decreases the net quality of the motion you're able to input into the robot as a result. So that, that, that's what we're building out today, a system that the robot itself will know and understand all of the forces that are exerted to the tissue. Because at the end of the day, you don't really care what the forces that exert it, are exerted to the tissue for most things, right? You, you, you only care that they're not above a certain threshold. Uh, there, there are some exceptions to that, like tensioning sutures, where you, you, you might actually care about the specific force. And uh, you know we can provide that either way. Very cool. Well, we're right up against it, but I would love just one more kind of forward-looking question uh, or answer to my forward-asking question. <laughs> yes, it's late, folks. Uh, Todd, you, you intrigued me with your 17-year-old driving a car because I have a 17-year-old driving my car and it happens to be a 12-year-old car. So he does not have a backup camera, which I'm actually very happy about because it does force him to look around, uh, although he's trying to put one in. Anyway, let's look ahead. It's amazing how things can change in 10 years. Now something can look so antiquated uh, just to 10 years past. So Todd, maybe you could start us off just looking ahead 10 years with active surgical. What, what does the OR look like in terms of visualization and, and active surgical? What, what, how different will it be from today? And we'll just ask the same question, Adam, to, and then Jeff, and then we'll close it out. Right. I think one of the things is, is the big tech companies, um, whether it's NVIDIA, whether it's Google, whether it's Apple, they're gonna be in the operating room partnered with, with medical companies and medical device companies. And um, what I see is the advanced visualization of today is going to lead to real AI in the future. Right now, AI is just a bumper sticker to get it through the FDA. I mean, what's your confidence interval? If I can see more things today, then I'm going to give myself and every single person out there more data and richer data. And, and the more information we can provide to the algorithms and the machine learning, et cetera, et cetera, all of a sudden, if I advanced visualization allows a robotic surgeon to see things that they've never seen before, then the data that's collected in the, and like I said, going into the machine learning algorithms, the AI will actually be something that people believe in. I think that AI and the inferencing models and, and working with companies like I mentioned, these tech companies with, with the vicariouses of the world. And, um, you know, and then I, I look at companies like Active, we're the conduit between those med device companies, those big giants that I used to work at and the, that I really love, the Bostons, the Olympus, the Smith and Nephews, and then, you know, the NVIDIAs and the, and the Googles and the Apples, how are they all getting together? And hopefully, you know, companies like Active Surgical are the conduit that allows us all to go work with Adam's company and other robotic technologies out there. And that's where I see the future. But I actually think AI will mean something then. It won't just be, well, no one's going to believe in that. It'll be real. Mm -hmm. And because the data is that rich from advanced visualization. Great point. Adam, uh, final thoughts? Every, every, everything Todd just said. Um, and uh, what that's going to look like when it's paired with robotics is the ability to actually do, do autonomous portions of a surgery or to at least autonomously protect against mistakes and to guide the surgeon through the surgery, which will result in safer surgeries. It'll result in faster surgeries. And, you know, 10 years might be pushing it a little bit, but will result in, especially that coupled with a system like ours, that it's very difficult to set up incorrectly. You don't have that poor site decision making can, can actually be at least partially conducted without the surgeon in the operating room. And I think we're already seeing that model with anesthesia today, and we'll be able to move it, move toward it uh, with surgery and leverage surgeons for really what they should be leveraged for, which is their their knowledge, their experience, their decision making capability, uh, rather than having them throw you know throw a million sutures over the course of their career. Fantastic, Jeff. Uh, final final thoughts to you. Yeah, I, I agree. You know, having done 
released many medical devices and doing the risk profile, trying to get the safety stuff done. One of the things we always fall back on is we always say, well, this is under the control of the surgeon. So then we can kind of like wash our hands of the risk, you know, on that. I think in the next five to 10 years, somebody's going to figure out how to, to jump past that. Uh, and they're going to, they're going to do the validation needed to make fully autonomous surgical surgery possible. And I think that'll be, that'll be the step that we, we need. I think right now we're, it's sort of an artificial boundary we've put it for ourselves. And once that's broken, I think it's going to, we're going to see a lot of improvements. Cool. Well, this, uh, this conversation exceeded my expectations. It was uh, fantastic. Thank you all for, uh, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having us. And uh, thank you all for, uh, for attending. And thanks, of course, to Biomerics for, for putting this program together. Uh, we will uh, not be back next week. We, we're, we're, we'll be back the week after Thanksgiving. So uh, this one will we'll have to hold you over for a while. And there's a lot to it. So maybe you want to go back and rewatch. And again, tell your friends and family they can uh, watch on demand. Thanks, everybody, for, uh, for joining us on, uh, on this week's Device Talks Tuesdays. <laughs>